Welcome everyone to this webcast, which is entitled The Secrets of Chawton House. My name is Martin Caddick, and I am a guide here at what Jane Austen knew as the Great House. At the time of, re of recording this, we are in lockdown, and I cannot visit Chawton. I wish I could have recorded this webcast from the rooms I mentioned, but I hope that this talk and the photographs I use will give you a bit of a feel for the house and its history. I took this photograph, for example, a few years ago on a beautiful, clear March morning. It was my first visit. And I fell in love with this lovely, stately old house. And I have spent the last couple of years trying to unravel some of its secrets and stories. Let me set the scene a little. This house was built by the Knight family, mostly between 1583 and 1590. It is still owned by Richard Knight, but having been restored, it is run by the Chawton House Trust on a long lease. It's best known for having been once owned by Jane Austen's brother, Edward, and Jane herself was a frequent visitor. But it has a rich, interesting history, quite apart from the Austen connection. Trying to condense 400 years of history into this short talk is no easy task. That 400 years encompasses the reigns of 17 monarchs and 15 owners from the Knight family, including four Richard Knights and three Edward Knights. So the potential for confusing everyone, including myself, is enormous. So what are the secrets of Chawton House? One of the questions we are often asked is whether we have any ghosts. No one working here has ever admitted to seeing one but we are told that we do have a ghost. Ours, apparently, is a grey lady who walks through the tapestry gallery. Jeremy Knight, who is the second son of the last squire, lived here from 1945 to 1987. He says that he never saw a ghost, but he adds that his father-in-law believes that the house was haunted and he refused to sleep in the bedrooms next to the tapestry gallery. And when Jane Austen first moved to the village, this house was being rented by the Middleton family. A daughter of that family, Mariah Middleton, wrote about her happy childhood here. And it's she who first writes about the Grey Lady ghost. Then during the Second World War, this house was used as a Bernardo's home for girl orphans from London. Some of them have since written to us with their recollections of living here. I will just read this short extract from one of those letters. I remember a grey lady ghost who had walked the staircase and who we were scared each other to death with about. She goes on to say, there was also a German prisoner who seemed to live in a big black shed on the back drive. His name was something like Dieter, a lovely kind man who made his toys that moved. Every Tuesday was sweet stay for us, and we'd all give a portion of our ration to this man who we felt belonged to us. Quite touching, I thought. The next question is, are there any secret cupboards or hiding places? The short answer is yes. There's one in the library, for example. We have something like 16 or 17,000 books in the house, including the Knight family collection. The old library holds a collection of about two and a half thousand of these books, mostly from before 1830, and these are all by woman or about woman or for woman. It's the best collection of early English women's writing outside the Bodleian or the British Library, and it's worth well over a million pounds. The picture of the library on the bottom right is from when Chawton House was used as a location for a docudrama last year. As I was watching it, I was bouncing up and down on the couch and annoying my wife by shouting, that's Chawton, that's Chawton, which she felt wasn't altogether suitable behaviour, given the subject of the programme was Auschwitz. But in amongst all those books, there's one shelf of impressive and weighty volumes. These were of more interest to the last squire, Edward Knight III, than any of the other books. It pulls down 
if you pull down on the top of these these volumes a secret cabinet opens up and that is where Edward used to keep his bottles of gin Edward III's great uncle and predecessor Montague Knight was altogether more sober and responsible the house that we know today owes a great deal to Monty he renovated much of the house restoring a Jacobean feel and removing the rather unfortunate 19th century attempts to modernize the look he put back the stone windows which Edward Austin had replaced with wooden sash windows and he removed the Roman cement from the walls that had concealed the brick and stone finishes that you now see Monty repaneled many of the rooms and as he did so he created many hidden cupboards around the house he found what he believed to be a priest hole which opened up in the roof the opening led down into a bottle shaped space behind the wall at one end of the great hall it's almost disappointing that during the restoration of the house we discovered a bricked up fireplace hidden behind this panelling leading the unromantic to infer that this priest hole was simply an unused chimney speaking of panelling all the original Tudor and Jacobean panelling in the Great Hall shown in this watercolour from the 1850s is still in place today and you can see witch marks carved in the panelling next to the fireplace from the time of James I this supposedly stopped witches coming down the chimney it obviously worked because there are no reports of any witches ever succeeding in doing so there are rumours of an exciting tunnel leading down to the stables but we've not yet found it once again the killjoys amongst us would like to tell us that the rumours were based on finds of old filled in Tudor cellars there are actually quite a few cellars albeit no dungeons under the house the picture on the top left taken from the docudrama I mentioned shows a cellar under the great hall <laughs> under the great hall and you can see its wine bins on the right the biggest secret or at least the biggest mystery about the house lies in its medieval origins there is some evidence of these in the cellars specifically there's a fine 13th century stone doorway and this is some of the best evidence that we have that this house was built on the site of an earlier manor there isn't anything else obvious remaining of that earlier manor but the oldest part of the house has a typically medieval layout with a great hall and a cross passage behind a screen and a buttery behind that all set set above the cellars and at the opposite end of the great hall is a cross wing containing the rooms for the lord and the family to retire into once dinner was done this is a layout that was already very old fashioned in 1583 when this part of the house was built and it would only have made sense if the builders the knights were building on the foundations of the old manor we do know something about that old manor we know it was built in 1224 using oak from Alice Holt Forest and that it had a 1000 acre deer park a chapel and two gardens we also know that it was built by the St Jean, the Saint Jean family, who are Norman barons based in Basing in Hampshire. We believe that they hoped to entice Henry III to stay and hunt with them. They chose Chawton because it lies on the route from London to Winchester. Winchester was still the administrative centre for, for England at the time. If the intention was to get the kings to visit, it worked. We know from court records that Henry III stopped at the manor 22 times and probably many more unrecorded times and that he sent barrels of wine here for feasting and it was not just Henry III it was Edward I and II and III and they each stayed here for as long as three weeks at a time we haven't found many records between then and Tudor times we know that the Saint Jean lands were divided between three daughters about the time of Agincourt and that Chawton was in the portion that ended up with John Bonville. Bonville's uncle was the steward of Cornwall and he was beheaded in the Wars of the Roses at the order of the young son of the Margaret of Anjou after a mock trial 
and this is an incident that was probably the inspiration for Ned Stark's execution in the series Game of Thrones. A Sir Thomas West owned Chawton, amongst other estates, from the time of Henry VIII to Queen Mary. He was childless, so he named William West, his nephew, as his heir. You see William West on the top right of the screen. William was so pleased by this that he decided to speed things along by poisoning his uncle. The attempt failed, and his disgruntled uncle had him locked in the Tower of London, and he later sold Chawton to the Knight family. As an aside, William was uh, released when Elizabeth I succeeded Mary, and he was restored as Lord de la War. His grandson, Thomas, the third Baron de la War, became governor of Virginia. The state of Delaware and the river Delaware are all named after him. The Knights were one of those families who grew wealthy in the prosperous Elizabethan times, rich enough to first rent and then buy the property and the rights to the manor. Chawton remained in the ownership of the Knight family from then right up to the present day. Their tenure was not without its challenges. It was in danger during the English Civil War when many of the houses in this area supported the Royalist cause. The parliamentarians arrived in force at Chawton House after their victory at the Battle of Alton. The squire had died a couple of years previously, leaving a young widow and their four-year-old son and heir, Richard, to face the roundheads. Family legend says that his young mother marched down the drive and pointed out that her son was far too young to be out fighting or to take sides in the war and they should leave the house alone and then she invited the officers up for, to the house for dinner. So the house survived and his mother ended up marrying a parliamentary officer, a major Azaria husband. Yet despite this unroyalist behaviour, the young squire was later knighted by Charles II for his loyalty. His picture remains at the house and you can see his statue in the church down the drive. Not once in the next hundred years did the estate pass from father to son, but instead it passed from si to siblings and second cousins. Most notable of these was Elizabeth Knight, who was the only female squire that Chawton has seen. She was something of a character, insisting that the church bells were rung whenever she arrived at Chawton. She also insisted that both her husbands change their name to Knight. Though perhaps that was not a hardship for her second husband, the quaintly named Bulstrode Peachy. It is hard not to admire her strength of character, as Chawton remained very much hers to manage despite her two marriages. Her picture remains in the house doing her best Queen Anne impression and gazing imperiously down at her two husbands. Elizabeth left the property to her second cousin, Thomas Brodnax, a property that included not only Chawton, but also West Dean and Sussex and Steventon and property in Winchester. Thomas, of course, had to change his name to Knight in order to inherit Elizabeth's estates. He became a very substantial landowner since he already owned a newly built mansion at Godmersham in Kent, as well as property in London and Sussex. He replicated many of the features at Godmersham at Chawton, including the flooring seen here, which was copied in the hall at Chawton. And you may recognise the picture on the right, which is of Godmersham set in Parkland. It's on the back of the latest £10 notes behind the image of Jane Austen. When Thomas took possession of Chawton, the gardens at Chawton were laid out in a formal style from the 17th century, shown in this picture. He remodelled the grounds in a fashionable new English landscape style, copied from Godmersham, and shown in the picture on the right. This picture was the inspiration for the recent, rest recent restoration of the estate. Both pictures, incidentally, are on display at Chawton House. So, how did Jane Austen's brother Edward, the third son of a relatively poor rector from Steventon, come to inherit these vast estates? Thomas's wife was a second cousin to the Reverend George Austen, and that is why George was given the living at Steventon. 
When their son, Thomas Knight II, married, he took his wife on honeymoon, an exciting tour of the far-flung family estates. They visited the Austens, and they took a liking to the well-mannered and affable young Edward, who was only 12 at the time. This silhouette by Wellings on the right shows the Reverend George Austen presenting Edward to the Knights. They took him along with them for the rest of the honeymoon and invited him to stay with them in following summers. They remain childless, perhaps not surprisingly, if they take a 12-year-old on honeymoon with them. And in due course, they decided to make Edward their heir, on condition he changed his name to Knight. So, the, so there's a good moral in this for our own children. Great rewards may come from being good-mannered and well-behaved. The portrait on the left, now back at Chawton House, is, is the young Edward in Italy, enjoying the grand tour paid for by the knights. Edward Austen may not have lived at Chawton, but his son Edward II did, or to be more precise, he was sent there after he loped to Gretna Green with his sister Fanny's stepdaughter, which hadn't gone down at all well with her father, who was an ultra conservative government minister. So if you think this picture makes him look like a model of Victorian respectability, just bear that in mind. So what happened to all their property and their vast estates? Basically, in the end, the Knights ran out of money. Edward Austen himself lost the equivalent of two million pounds when the bank that his brother Henry set up collapsed. And he had to pay nearly as much again to settle a dispute over his inheritance. Edward had 11 children and his son Edward II had 16 children, in contrast to all those childless Knights of the past. And as we all know, children are extremely expensive, even without the school fees, the marriage settlements, the debts, the military commissions that the Knights had to pay for. Underlying this, rents from the land were reducing. And at first, the family easily coped by selling off parcels of the land and consolidating their holdings. But of course, that just reduced their income. By World War I, the Knights were left with just Chawton, although this included nearly the entire village and over 5,000 acres of land. When Montague Knight's nephew and successor Lionel Knight died in 19, 1934, nearly half the estate had to be sold to pay death duties and legacies. Lionel's son, Edward Knight III, was the last squire, and to make ends meet, he was reduced to selling first the houses in the village and then the remaining estate and then the heirlooms and the portraits. And finally, he literally sold the family silver. Edward died in 1987, by which time he was overdrawn and the house was in urgent need of repair. His son, Richard Knight, the current owner, had no hope of being able to afford the repairs needed, but he managed to bring back together some of the lost parkland and to secure the remaining heirlooms, which are still in the house today. The day was saved when Sandy Lerner bought the 125-year lease for the house and grounds. She was a hugely successful businesswoman, the co-founder of both Cisco and Urban Decay, and she was an admirer of both Jane Austen and the other woman authors from that period. You can get some idea of the state of the house by the time she arrived from the two photographs at the top of the screen. She spent the money needed well over £15 million to restore the house and to set it up as a learning centre about early English women's writing. The restoration took 10 years, but the transformation seen on the right was complete. Lerner set up the trust that runs the house today and Richard Knight remains a trustee. The house has been open to the public for the last five years. And when we are free to get out once again, we can now all enjoy this grand old home. I'd like to thank you all for listening to this webcast. I hope you found it interesting. If you have any questions or comments, please contact me at the, at the email shown. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all at Chawton House later in the year. Thank you.